So let's go ahead and get our presentation started for the day. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming. My name is Barbie Goosens and I'm the Academic Programs and Services Manager at University of Oregon School of Law. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Oregon Law Perspectives webinar. The Oregon Law Perspectives series brings the work of our faculty to our colleagues, our students, our alumni, and the broader public. Today's session is the third and penultimate presentation in our summer series, and we're joined today by two remarkable scholars for a really fun and informative session on what we can learn from Star Wars about effective conflict resolution. Professor Re Jen Reynolds is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Oregon Law and the Faculty Director of the nationally ranked award-winning Oregon ADR Center. She has served as the national chair of the ADR section of the Association of American Law Schools and is a celebrated educator, earning both University of Oregon's Ersted Award for Distinguished Teaching and the law school's highest honor for excellence in teaching, the Orlando J. Hollis Teaching Award. Professor Reynolds received her BA from University of Chicago, her MA in English from University of Texas at Austin, and her JD from Harvard Law School. She teaches civil procedure, conflict of laws, negotiation, and mediation. Her research interests include dispute systems design, plea bargaining and specialty courts, and cultural influences and implications of alternative processes. Also joining us is Professor Noam Ebner. He's a professor of negotiation and conflict resolution at Creighton University's Higher College of Business. Prior to joining the faculty at Creighton, Professor Ebner taught at universities in Israel, Turkey, and Costa Rica. He practiced as an attorney, negotiator, and mediator at his Jerusalem-based firm, trained mediators for the court system, and has conducted hundreds of workshops on negotiation and conflict resolution for a broad range of private sector industries, governmental agencies, universities, and nonprofits around the world. Professor Ebner received LLB and LLM degrees from Hebrew University in Israel, followed by postgraduate diploma in social science research from the University of Bradford in the UK. He has authored and co-authored four books and over 100 articles, book chapters, and other pieces. His writing focuses on negotiation, trust, online dispute resolution, negotiation, and conflict resolution pedagogy, and the, and the future of negotiation, med, mediation, and legal fields. For more on Jen and Noam, please visit their website at starwarsandconflictresolution.com. The plan for our session today is for our panelists to speak for about 45 minutes and then to take your questions. If you have a question, please feel free to use the Q&A feature on the bottom of the Zoom bar. Only the panelists and I can see your questions and they can be anonymous if you so choose. We will gather them all and attempt to get, them, get to them at the end of the presentation. For those of you who are seeking CLE credit, you will receive an email after the event requesting your bar number so that we can report that back to the Oregon State Bar. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our panel. Go ahead and take it away, Jen. Well, thank you so much. Um... Thank you so much, Barbie. Uh, let's see. It is very wonderful to be here today. Um, as Barbie said, I'm Jen Reynolds. I'm a professor here at the University of Oregon School of Law. I'm very grateful that my dear friend and co-editor, Noam, is um, here with me for this session. Uh, Noam and I met a long time ago, I, I think at a conference on alternative dispute resolution. Uh, anyway, we've been talking about Star Wars and conflict resolution for at least seven or eight years now. And at some point we started plotting out a project for studying conflict and negotiation through Star Wars. So our plan today is to talk briefly about this project before we turn to some recurrent conflict and negotiation themes in the Star Wars saga. I'm gonna say a few words about the focus of our project, which has been books so far mostly. Uh, and then Noam will provide an overview of the purpose and our mission when it comes to this project. Um, and after that, we will get to some Star Wars. So just very briefly, uh, here is our book. This is our book, Star Wars and Conflict Resolution. Uh, this book came out seven months ago in December of 2022. Uh, it was published by DRI Press. Noam and I did not write all the chapters in the book. Uh, it was a community effort. We had chapters by more than two dozen uh, conflict and negotiation experts 
both practitioners and academics. These were amazing contributors. They wrote chapters on diverse topics such as power, emotions, um, unconscious biases, difficult tactics, conflict styles, and of course, conflict resolution processes like negotiation, arbitration, mediation. We were also assisted in this work by five incredible University of Oregon law students. Um, some, a couple have graduated, we've added a couple more and we could not be more thrilled with them. We're now working on our second book. It has the nickname of episode two, that's what we, we call it. Um, this book is gonna build on a lot of the topics of the first book while adding quite a few more. So in this book, we're gonna have chapters on leadership, um, the structural dynamics of conflict, the role of greed, uh, stress and power, workplace dynamics, and much more. So our second book is going to have 20 chapters. Our first, first book had 18. And we are organizing the chapters of the second book around the trilogies. We do have some stuff on Rogue One in there, but we mostly focus on the, the three trilogies of the Star Wars saga. So we're very excited about this next volume. It's hard not to think about a third book, um, but we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. So with that, um, tell us about the purpose and ambition, Noam. It's really hard to talk about Star Wars without thinking in threes. There's just no way around that. Um, so I, I guess the, the basic purpose of this sort of, as, as Jen and I were just talking about Star Wars and conflict for fun and because we're nerds, but to move past that, um, you know, we both realized how often in our teaching careers and in our training careers, so many people have, have mentioned in our classrooms um, that, that th this stuff, this knowledge of negotiation, this basic awareness of how to function well in conflict, isn't just something that we need for whatever purpose we came here for, let's say law students or lawyers uh, taking a training or, or, or managers taking a course. Um, this isn't something that we only use for our professional life. And everybody needs to know this for so much of our day-to-day -day interpersonal life. And, uh, you know, as we realized that, and it struck true with us, you know, for us as it did, as it did for everyone else, um, uh, and it occurred to us that, that if, if, if everyone knew just a little more of this, then imagine, imagine that world. Imagine what that world could look like. And whether you're into world peace writ large or just into communities functioning better, business functioning better, um, you know, the, 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 the huge polarized divisions that we, that we are familiar with here in the U.S. and around the world, um, all of that being managed just through a slightly different language and through people who knew just a little bit more about constructive approaches to dealing with those things. Imagine that world. So we imagined that world. And then we also imagined, yeah, but you know, we, we're very busy as it is. And to teach 8 billion people how to do all that thing. And also, you know, we're just, we're just teachers. We're not, we're not YouTube rock stars who can just, you know, say something and everybody will hear it. Um, and so what we uh, what we uh, decided to do uh, is to look for um, look for things that had really ready made audiences at that scale. You know, of course, there are a lot of pop culture uh, um, phenomena that have ready made audiences of millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions. And here we are back at Star Wars, uh, a, a which has ready made, very passionate audience of hundreds of millions, many of whom, not all of course, but many of whom are willing to hear about anything as long as it's connected to Star Wars. So our idea was if we could, if we could hitch the wagon of, of negotiation and conflict resolution to the engine of pop culture, and in this case, to the engine of Star Wars or the hyperdrive of Star Wars, um, there's no telling how many people we might be able to reach. And that essentially is our audience in this book. This book was not written, wasn't written for academics, it wasn't written for professionals, it was written for everyone. You don't have to have any background in, in, in conflict or in anything else in order to, to enjoy the book. All you need is a basic appreciation for Star Wars. You don't even need to be one of those deep, deep nerds. And, and I think that, you know, besides those reasons, I think that Jen and I both learned so much about conflict topics, some that 
we thought we knew everything about, and it turned out that we didn't, and some that we'd never heard about or considered before. And we learned about these because once people started thinking about conflict and Star Wars, new ideas came up. And finally, it's just a load of fun. Or is that just me, Jen? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's super fun. And um, uh, yeah, exactly. We we have this desire to help improve conflict literacy. It's our belief that um, that this is, uh, uh, you know, the perfect time uh, to be really thinking about uh, teaching people more broadly about conflict. And Star Wars, of course, is endlessly interesting in this space. Um, so with that, though, let's get into some of the conflict and negotiation themes of the Star Wars saga. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. So when it comes to conflict and negotiation in Star Wars, there is so much to choose from. I mean, the, it's called Star Wars, after all. It's, it's full of conflict. Um, for this session, we had decided we decided that we would do a like a frequently asked questions kind of approach. We get a lot of questions and we decided to share some of the most common ones we've received from our readers and from students and from um, Comic-Con attendees. So we've got we've got a we've got a, a, a group of questions here for you to for you to hear. Um, we're going to talk about these questions from the conflict and negotiation perspective, given our orientation. There, of course, are going to be lots of ways you can understand these questions, but we're going to focus on the conflict angles. And because our upcoming book focuses on the trilogies, we decided to select six questions from the trilogies. Um, the first question is going to come from the prequel trilogy, which includes, of course, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. Then our second question is going to um, sort of derive from the original trilogy, which includes A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back. And Return of the Jedi, A New Hope, of course, is the first Star Wars movie released in theaters in 1977. A lot of us just think of it as Star Wars. It's a formative film for many of us. And finally, then the third question is going to come from the sequel trilogy, which include The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker, and so on. And so um, I'll ask the first question, and Noam will ask the second, and we will go from there. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A, just as Barbie said. We plan on having time at the end, and we would love getting questions from you. So please, please do not hesitate. Okay, so here is the first question. No, this question is for you. Can someone be peaceful and aggressive? So this is from the prequels. I can pull that off before, you know, before breakfast. So I'd say yes, um, but sort of in a, in a deeper way and in a more Star Warsy way. I think, and uh, I think I think that in Star Wars, it's so easy to to break down characters into, you know, the good guys and the bad guys. Pardon me for the gendered language, but you know, it's, it's um, and. And, but when you look at them, you start to notice that actually everybody fights. Everybody fights a lot. And it's not really as if everybody in one camp or on one side or on you know, this side of the force or that, everybody there is peaceful and everyone on the other side is aggressive and it's such a, a, such a, a clear distinction. Um, the Jedi don't seem to be less violent than the Sith. You know, for keepers of peace and justice, they settle a whole lot of things with lightsabers. Um, they help blow up a whole lot of Death Stars. So, so sort of simplistic distinctions aren't aren't necessarily the most the most helpful. And then, I guess, I guess one way to look at this comes through um, uh, through through distinguishing between uh, your goals and the means that you choose to achieve those goals. So, the goals and the means to the end. So it's interesting because the Jedi say that they want, they're the keepers of peace and justice in the galaxy. It's interesting that both Palpatine and um, Darth Vader, Anakin uh, in, in, um, in Revenge of the Sith, they both say that they have brought peace, that peace was their goal as well. Um, and, and, and so again, it's hard to make that distinction, but uh, one distinction that you can make is that you don't see the Jedi initiating 
Galactic Wars. You don't see the Jedi building Death Stars. So maybe that distinction starts to come to light, but maybe more important and more important for us, us human negotiators here in, in this galaxy is that when you think about being both peaceful and aggressive, then you might be able to, to consider the differences between what is our nature and what strategy do we choose to match any particular situation? Because I'm sure that many Jedi, no matter how, how violent their lives were, um, they still felt themselves to be peaceful, you know, essentially peaceful people who just often needed to respond aggressively. Like, like Qui-Gon Jinn in, in this picture, and this picture is, is, is in the, 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 the duel of the fates scene in episode one. Um, that dark blur on, on, uh, in the corner, that's, uh, that's Darth Maul, who's pacing back and forth very, very aggressively um, in the middle of a, of a fight, just waiting for the force field between them. Oh, thanks. Just waiting for the force field between them. That's magic. Um, <laughs> waiting for the force field between them to disappear so they could continue the fight. He's pacing back and forth like a caged, like, really like a caged animal. And Qui-Gon Jinn is sitting there meditating, drawing his strength from a peaceful or, or at least a quieter source and Qui-Gon Jinn is drawing his sort his his power from from some pool of of aggression um and and I think I think that makes a difference because uh I mean I know from my experience um Jen you know this a, a, a long long time ago and in a galaxy far far away I served in a military so uh, and whether whether you want to call it offensive or defensive, you know, depending who the PR person is for that, you know, our activity, any military's activity, is aggressive and violent. There's there's no escaping that. But I honestly joined this military uh, and and participated in it, thinking that I was doing this for an ultimately peaceful purpose or an ultimate purpose of peace. I know you might you may say I'm a dreamer, but but that. I may have been naive back then, but that was uh, my my state of perception uh, back then. And I, I think now now I'm thinking about Ahsoka, um, who basically said the same thing at the end of the uh, the end of the Clone Wars. He said, like, uh, you know, we Jedi, we 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 train to be peacemakers, or we want to be peacemakers. But I spent my whole life as a soldier, and so um, and so there's a difference between our nature and what we actually find ourselves doing. And, and I think that if you switch out the word aggressive, which has a negative connotation and you put in another term, like the, the negotiation and conflict term is often competitive. In other words, it's focusing on your own goals. Then the answer is clearly yes, you can generally be a peaceful person, but recognize that in some situations, you when the stakes are high enough, when whatever it is you're after is important enough, you might need to pursue getting that in a you know in a more competitive way than just saying oh it's all good man right and 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 let's hope we get it without pursuing it and without making the effort and without engaging the other and maybe telling the other hey you didn't plan on giving this to me but i really want it now how are we going to do this um and uh and and i think that, that really good negotiators know how to make that shift intentionally consciously we have we have a chapter in our first book and you know basically entirely dedicated to that shift so that's uh that that's so what i have in my mind is that that it's sort of human to characterize anybody who's not giving us what we want as aggressive <laughs> like, uh, let alone when they are doing some behavior that might we might translate as aggressive but but i think in our own mind we are all the peaceful defenders and understanding how to work with people, understanding how to work with conflict is all about understanding both perspectives, both points of view. I, that, that's what I've got so far, Jen. What do you think? Oh, I think that that's, that's, that's really fascinating. I think this focus on goals is key. Um, uh, I, some people, though, are substantively uh, committed to pacifism, you know, to, to a peaceful yeah. interactions. And so, and that's, that is a, a separate kind of issue. I, I think that, um, we have a chapter in our uh, upcoming book on leadership, mm -hmm. and in this chapter, um, as you know, Noam, the uh, the authors compare Padme and Palpatine as leaders. And what's so funny about that comparison is how similar they are. And I think the reason they're similar is that Palpatine often uses a more measured diplomatic approach when he wants 
because he's really thoughtful about his goals. I mean, his goals are bad to be sure. Um, they are not the same in terms of their goals, but it's a, uh, I think recognizing that we're making choices all the time, either consciously or not around how we're going to behave. And that, that, uh, that, that is kind of the more salient question than, you know, can I be, can I be only peaceful or only aggressive? Right. And, and Padme really, really, you know, she says she, she right. embodies the, I can do diplomatic solutions and I can do aggressive negotiations. It's just a matter of, you know, where we are and who we're dealing with. I'd prefer the diplomatic solutions. She would always prefer the diplomatic solutions, but that wasn't the end of it. And that's part of her, you know, thinking now, backing away from Star Wars and thinking about to Star Wars character development. That that's that's her growth, and I'd even say you know it's it's sort of her moral growth, even though it's it's growth away from pure pacifism. It's, right. It's it's her moral development from episode one to episode two. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Which, well, that's Padme, you, which Padme do you like better? <laughs> I like I like the I well I don't like the sad Padme, but I uh, no. you know it's a uh, okay. So moving on. So yeah. uh, thank you for that. Our next question is going to come from the original trilogy. So, Jen, this one, this one's for you. Han shot first. When should you shoot first? Okay, thank you for this wonderful question. This is actually one of the most common questions we get. Um, in fact, we do have a chapter in our book on this very topic, uh, specifically about whether Han behaved ethically when he shot first in this interaction with Greedo. So as you see here, and just to refresh your memory, in the very first Star Wars movie, A New Hope, Greedo, the bounty hunter, tracks down Han Solo to the cantina, and then while they're talking, Han secretly positions his blaster under the table and shoots Greedo dead in the middle of the conversation. So this kind of a choice is, um, is very interesting uh, philosophically and legally and otherwise. Um, for today, I wanna set aside the legal implications and although the ethical implications are fascinating, I'm going to leave those aside too and recommend you uh, to that chapter by Deb and Emily Kai in our book. And uh, and then you know just just to you know point out something that probably many of you know, this whole Han shot first question has been very controversial for years. There have been multiple versions of this scene inserted into the movie. The version I saw in 1977 had Han shooting first. The version that is on Disney Plus right now does not. So George Lucas altered this scene to have Greedo shoot first and then to have, he altered it again to have them both shooting at the same time. Um, and all of this is just more evidence that shooting first is problematic. You know, we know there's something about it that's, it is not straightforwardly positive. It's not obviously a moral choice. And so um, the authors of the film have been dealing with it and we can think about it from a conflict perspective. So in interpersonal conflict, in negotiation, um, one of the main reasons why people shoot first in conflict, either literally like Han or more metaphorically in the sense that they immediately go on the attack or they immediately escalate things, they do this because, because they want to generate power or leverage in the encounter. And typically the reason people want to generate power or leverage in an encounter is that they feel, for whatever reason, powerless, relatively powerless. They feel weak or they feel threatened or they feel vulnerable or they feel desperate. And certainly that's true for Han here. And despite his nonchalant bearing, um, I think he's he's pretty afraid. Note that he doesn't shoot Greedo just randomly. He doesn't shoot him because he doesn't like the cut of his jib. I mean, you know, he he shoots him because he's afraid of losing something. He's afraid of losing his money. He's afraid of losing his ship, his freedom, maybe even his life, maybe Chewbacca's life. So Greedo is brandishing a gun here, as you can see. We know he's a ruthless bounty hunter. So this is not a crazy fear, but it is fear. And we often see the same dynamic in conflict and in negotiation. A person who feels fear about losing something may behave aggressively to gain control of the situation and prevent that loss. The same thing can happen if somebody desperately wants something. The fear of not getting what you want can lead to aggressive behaviors. And in both cases, it's a uh, there's like a felt weakness or a lack that manifests as an attack. 
So what does this mean for students of conflict and negotiation? Well, there are two quick takeaways um, that I want to give you today. So first, when you encounter a guns blazing or a shoot first and ask questions later kind of negotiator, you should remember that these behaviors are rooted in fear. It may not seem like the person is afraid, but that doesn't mean that they're not. And so if you can resist responding to the content of the attack, but instead seek to understand more about where they're coming from, looking for their interests, as we, as we often say, this can be actually a pretty productive way of managing attacking behaviors. Um, to do this well, you have to remember that that aggression is not about you. It is not something that you should internalize or take personally. I know this is easier said than done, uh, but it's it's important thing to remember. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and to answer the question specifically, when is shooting first a good strategy? If you are considering whether to shoot first in your own conflict or negotiation, this is actually going to be kind of a, related back to the previous question. Uh, you should be very clear about the context and your purposes, uh, you know, why it makes sense in this case, and also about the co possible consequences. So, you know, being clear about context and purposes, at a minimum, when you go into negotiation or conflict, um, or, you know, conflict resolution, uh, you need to think about what you want and why. It's helpful to consider what your leverage is, what your alternatives are, what you know about them, including what they might want and why, as you're thinking about how you want to open the negotiation. Um, now, there may be short-term benefits to shooting first in the negotiation in the sense that maybe the other person will back down and give you what you want. And perhaps you really thought it through and you see value in a particular relationship or context to presenting yourself as super aggressive, right? And so you may have really been intentional and you make this choice intentionally. Um, that said, usually when people start off with aggression, they have not thought it through. They assume they need to use aggression to get what they want, and they fail to see that there are other approaches. Um, so in many cases, going on the attack right away may not serve our goals. And shooting first in conflict and negotiation puts the other person on the defensive necessarily, makes it hard to engage them in problem solving. Uh, being attacking can lead to other negative consequences, like it uses up a lot of psychic energy or it destroys relationships or you get a bad reputation, or you narrow your focus so much to a particular position or what you think is possible that you lose that broad view of what's motivating us and, and what might what, what, what might we do here. So, so there's more to say, of course, but I'll just close with, you know, preemptive strikes are fraught, whether you're talking about nations or you're talking about individuals. Careful consideration of reasons, context, alternatives, and consequences is key. So. Yeah, what, a, what a wise answer. And the reason <laughs> I say that is because, um, you know, I'm not grading you, but if you, if you ask the typical conflict resolution person, like, when should we shoot first? The answer is typically never. And while you, while you did say and summarize that it is fraught and you need to think about it very, very carefully, I'm concerned that that perhaps too many people who, you know, who work in conflict with conflict and, and resolve conflict, don't think it from, don't think it through from the other side. That might there be situations in which it is either a good idea or a necessity, and if we actually gave it some thought, we might then be able to do it, not from fear and not from knee jerk reaction to a situation, but rather from wise. We need to, you know, and to do it proportionately so that you're not in, incurring that kind of backlash that, that, that you just got, whether it's a backlash of the other party trying to hurt you even worse or a backlash of them not willing, them not wanting to work with you because, because they're now on the defensive. Um, food for thought. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so let's turn to our third question. All right. Here we go. What makes us join the fight, Noam? So, so in Star Wars, everybody fights a lot, and nobody, you know, very few people seem to have reticent or seem to be reticent about fighting. Um, and there's this one, 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 one point that's really a very, very surprising point in the in the in the sequels in in Episode Seven, where uh, Finn and Rey meet Han Solo, and then they meet Maz Kanata, and they're on their way to join the Resistance, who are the you know the 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 new rebels, and all of a sudden Finn says, "No, I'm not coming." 
And that's such a surprising moment. Uh, we're used to heroes being gung ho, not heroes saying, I'm, you know, I want to get far away from this as possible. Um, and so there was there was that that uh, that really interesting question of why why was Finn that way? And in this case, Finn. Well, let's get to, I'll get to that in a second. But when you think about through Star Wars. Um, we have many scenes of people joining fights, whether they're just, you know, very local right here, right now. I drew a blaster, you drew a blaster, or I pulled my lightsaber, you pulled yours. Um, uh, fight scenes. And then you have the, the broader picture question of what leads people to, to sign up or to commit themselves to a fight when they were previously perhaps very, very peaceful people. So, for example, what leads people to join a rebel alliance against an empire. Um, and uh, conflict doesn't come out of nowhere. People join up to engage in these conflicts for, for, for a variety of reasons. And it's really important to understand these reasons because if we understand and recognize some of these reasons, then um, A, you know, from we might be able to, to mitigate some of them and therefore have less people fighting or have people less motivated to join fights and maybe bring fights down to levels at which you can resolve them because they're unpopular fights. And on the other hand, let's say if you are someone, if you are organizing a rebel alliance for a good cause against a, an evil empire, it's worthwhile to know, you know what makes people join fights because you're going to need to understand that in your uh, in individual and broad scale negotiations trying to bring people to join the cause. So, um, you know, when thinking about this question, I remember that, that the Star Wars novelization, I'm going uber nerd here. So the novel, the novelization of Star Wars opens up with a quote from Princess Leia's diary, apparently written after all this was said and done. And it says they were something like they were the wrong people, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Naturally, they became heroes. So, and, and that sort of says, well, you know, if you just happen to be in circumstances that things happen that way and you step up, then you've joined the fight and that was for a good purpose. But I think that it's not as vague as that and it's not as random as that. So so what? why do we see people joining fights in Star Wars? Um, so like Finn sometimes, uh, uh, why did he join? Oh, let me say before that, it's not just why do people join the Rebel Alliance? Why do people join the Empire? In terms of why do people you know sign up for to, to be a part of the Imperial Navy or to be a stormtrooper? So one reason they can fight is sometimes we fight because we're coerced to fight. Finn was abducted as a child, you know, uh, and, and trained as a stormtrooper, and that's all he knew. Um, sometimes people are coerced into fighting. Sometimes we're driven to fight because of a sense of it, it's now or never. Like this is the one moment at which we all must think of Jin Erso's plea to the rebel council. To, to go and steal the, the Death Star plans. It's now where there's not gonna be any future of this. There's the sense of, sometimes there's a sense of nothing to lose that brings us to join the fight. Like we've lost everything, it doesn't matter anymore. Think about uh, Luke agreeing to go to Alderaan with Ben Kenobi after his homestead is burnt and, and his aunt and uncle have been killed. Um, sometimes you just, you've just taken enough from your oppressor and you wanna hurt them even if you can't win necessarily, but you just want to hurt them rather than dodging them. Uh, and 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 here I'm thinking about uh, about how how Luthen Rael was was uh, uh, sort of engaging with Cashin Andor when he was trying to recruit him, and he said, "Don't you want to do something more meaningful? Don't you want to hit them where it hurts? I can show you how to do that." And ultimately, that that's what brought Andor aboard. Uh, um, sometimes we we engage in conflict to save someone. To protect someone, like like Lando, uh, like Lando going to to save Han, joining joining the rebellion in order to save Han when before he had been, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, an individual not joining the fight. Um, sometimes we join the fight because you know we hate sand and it's cold out in space. So so that's you know like Anakin. So so there there are, there are all these reasons and more. I think it's also so interesting just to just for a moment to focus on why why we don't join the fight. And there are also more um, 
There are some more examples in Sars of why we don't join the fight. Remember Luke when Ben Kenobi's trying to get him, just, you know, you're going to need to learn the ways of the force if you want to come to me with me to Alderaan and, you know, and be a part of all this. And Luke is, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I can't do that. I got to go home. It's late. Um, I'm in trouble as it is, right? And uh, my uncle's going to kill me. I can't get involved. I got work. It's too far away. And all this litany of reasons for not joining the fight. And, and think about conflict in your own lives. Uh, that's really, that's real. It's too far away. It's too much of a schlep. I don't have the energy. Our real reasons for, for not joining fights. Um, another reason is some, a delusion that, that I don't need to join this fight because I'm okay. And it'll, it'll, I'll, I'll be okay, right? Generoso saying, I can just not look up and I'll be fine. I don't see the empire's flag flying. I'll be fine. Cash and Andor feeling, I can, I can keep scurrying around and, and taking care of number one and taking care of me and my mother and that's all I need to take care of. I don't need to join the big fight, I'll be okay. And then realizing that, that you know, that's, that's never true. And, and finally, you know, if, uh, back to Andor is um, just this self-delusional notion that whatever we're in now is as bad as it's going to get and we can live with this. So think about Marva's speech at the end of Andor. She says, we've been sleeping. We've been sleeping all this time. The empire has been taking over a little and we've been focusing on, on work and family and taking care of our planet and everything and, and deluding ourselves that we're gonna be okay. It's enough, it won't get worse. Well, that keeps us from, that keeps us from joining fights. So I guess the takeaway here is that there, there are a lot of good reasons to join fights. Some are objectively good reasons and some of them are self-delusion. So maybe think of a fight that you've been a part of, a time that you decided to join a conflict and ask yourself retrospectively, was there an objective reason to join that or did it just seem like a good idea at the time because of some internal process? And the same thing goes for a fight that you stayed out of. There, that, that's what I got. <laughs> when do you fight, Jen? Well, it kind of leads well into the next question. So maybe, mm. we, should, maybe we should just go to oh. the next question. Mm. Yeah, I can see why that is. Yeah. So what impacts the loyalty have on conflict is one of the things you're going to say, well, sometimes we join the fight because we're loyal to something, someone. That's exactly what I'm going to say. So, oh, oh. so we are actually, this question is kind of interesting because it's actually kind of a condensed version of a bunch of different similar mm. questions that we often get about alliances and partnerships and arch enemies and relationships and how all of those contribute to conflict and conflict resolution. So we packaged it in this question into this idea of loyalty, kind of defining loyalty very broadly and in a common way as standing by somebody, standing by some idea, even if at times this ends up going against your own personal self-interest. So I like this idea of, of loyalty. Um, in this context, especially after hearing what Noam just said, because understanding loyalty is important in today's world where we have extreme partisanship and so-called tribalism. Um, and these things have really exacerbated divisiveness in our politics and in our communities and in our families. So, um, you know, many people have said, why are we so divided? I think one possible answer is, you know, loyalty. And so why do I say this? Well, uh, Everybody wants to feel like they belong. Everyone wants to feel safe and secure. So given that people seek belonging and affiliation and political power and social influence, loyalty is something that we want from others and something we want to give others. And so when you think about it this way, it's clear that loyalty is going to have big impacts on conflict, especially paired with what Noam just said. Loyalty could quell conflict between people by reminding them of their common ground and their mutual commitment. It could exacerbate conflict between people by creating us and them dynamics uh, that harden into partisanship. And so then depending on where your loyalties lie, you may find yourself called to battle, called to the fight, you know, either literally or in a dispute between workmates or on Twitter or something else. And this fight not, might not even be your fight, um, but to demonstrate your loyalty, you engage. And so there are lots of dimensions to this question. And the question itself is a great jumping off point for the prequels, because we're back to the prequels now. We've circled back. This is question four, so we're back in the prequels. Uh, because really, the prequels are the story of competing for Anakin's loyalty uh, in, you know, in one way of looking at it. So you can think about the prequels 
of as uh, through the lens of Anakin's shifting and sometimes incompatible loyalties to his mother, to Padme, to the Jedi Order, to Qui-Gon, to Obi-Wan, and finally to the Emperor. Here we see Anakin with the Chancellor, who, you know, you all know, turns out to be the evil Emperor Palpatine. And so some quick context for those of you who don't remember this scene, Anakin has been having dreams that his wife Padme will die in childbirth. He doesn't want that to happen. In this scene, Palpatine is telling Anakin about a powerful Sith Lord who had the power to save people from death. So Anakin, of course, is quite taken with this story. Um, in terms of loyalty, Palpatine knows that Anakin is powerful. He wants to have him ha as his apprentice. In other words, he wants Anakin's loyalty. Palpatine is laying the groundwork for getting Anakin's loyalty by exploiting Anakin's existing love and loyalty to Padme. So it works at the end of the prequels, of course. Um, Anakin pledges himself to the emperor, pledges his loyalty to the emperor, says, I will do whatever you ask. And, you know, he sounds almost relieved when he does, because it's been a lot of turmoil for him trying to figure out to whom he is loyal and to what. So um, uh, we have a book in our, our chapter in our book that outlines these same dynamics in terms of interests and values. They use sort of a different frame. Uh, there's like a tension, they say, for Anakin between the values he ho holds as a Jedi and the interests that he has around his own status and around Padme. Um, these two things are in tension. And we can think of these same tensions when we think about loyalty. So um, uh, if you have deep or political or ideological differences in your family, you're going to know what I'm talking about when I talk about these tensions that uh, around how do you remain true to your principles and true to other people at the same time. It is very surreal to love someone and at the same time think to yourself, but only a bad person could hold their views. How can I love a bad person? Am I perpetuating their bad views by loving them? And so on and so forth. Our loyalties create dilemmas and tensions for us. And so given all this, when we look at this question, and we ask what impacts loyalty has on conflict, we see really two different conflict spaces emerge. There's an external space where you have loyalties creating allies and divisions. And in this external space, partisan energies spark or they escalate conflict. And this is especially true given that partisanship can affect perception and then partisan-fueled perceptions of contested events can make conflict more likely and more difficult to resolve. Which then brings us to the second conflict space that emerges when you think about loyalty, um, which is the internal space, where loyalty to different ideas and people can cause you to experience an internal struggle that can be very painful. How do you resolve these competing loyalties? Of course, one strategy the Jedi use uh, was to um, forbid attachments. You know, you're not allowed to marry, you're not allowed to stay with your family. Get those deep loyalties out of the mix. But shutting down those two impulses for human connection doesn't work out for the Jedi. And certainly conflict experts would not advise uh, refraining from relationships as a conflict management strategy. It's not a good idea. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I'll just wrap this up. I'll leave you with one last thought on loyalty and conflict. Uh, years ago, I was conducting a training where people... Um, we're in a simulation and they could form alliances or not. And uh, they were supposed to do so based on whether or not the alliances made sense for them. Um, uh, one of the participants I had formed an alliance with somebody who was a bad alliance partner. And this person totally took advantage of him. And uh, the, the guy ended up doing terribly on the exercise. And afterward we were debriefing and I said, why did you stay with this terrible partner and vote for everything that he wanted? And, and he just said simply, well, I gave him my word. And so that's what I had to do. And he was kind of embarrassed, although he didn't know what else he could have done. His partner admitted in the debrief that he had been completely manipulating him. And it led to an interesting discussion about how you remain loyal, but also question. How can you remain loyal, but also open? How do you remain loyal to others and to yourself at the same time, right? So this is, I think, one of the core challenges that Anakin faces and tries to resolve by just becoming loyal to one person and one thing the emperor but ultimately we know that that even doesn't work out for him because his um uh uh he's more complicated than that and um this is one of the reasons we love star wars so much so okay you know i mean, just as you talked about that uh, that simulation participant i was thinking i was thinking about um, um han and chewy that that chewbacca must go through that same 
being, you know, six times before breakfast every day, you know, Han goes off and does some crazy thing. And you know, Chewbacca's thinking, why am I in this? And, oh, because I promise, right? And so he sticks with him um, no matter what. That's, yeah, exactly. So there's in a certain amount of that, I think is healthy and good. There's just that line that we all have to sort of be be examining so that we're not in the situation where we're um, blindly loyal. So I guess maybe it's important to think of loyalty as active, not passive. You know, the blind loyalty that Anakin gives to the emperor at the end of Revenge of the Sith, that makes possible all kinds of manipulations and bad things um, that, uh, uh, that don't even really match, I think, the person Anakin is. So, okay. I mean, you know, obviously he's complicated. All right, so a, a time check. Let's let's do our fifth question, Norman, and see where we are because I don't want to miss out on any of our audience questions. Does that sound good? I actually think that uh, that we might be right there, and we should take uh, audience questions and see if we have time left afterwards. Okay, that sounds fine. And audience, if we uh, don't get to our last two questions, we will put them up on our website. Our answers to them <laughs> because they're very exciting questions. And just to preview them for you, I'm just going to show them the questions. Is that okay, Noam? Yeah, sure. So that you know, like, so one of the questions is going to be, is Luke a good negotiator? The answer may surprise you. And uh, the next, the final one is going to be, how do we resist an oppressive evil empire? So this is word for word a question I got at the Emerald City Comic Con this past March. And um, I think about it all the time. Now, since I've been asked that, and of course, it's a story of Star Wars, so we will answer both of those on the web, but let's look at the questions. Thank you so much, Jen and Noam. Uh, looks like we have one um, right up here at the top. Uh, if someone doesn't like something that you like, i.e. sand because it's coarse, rough, and irritating, it gets everywhere, what is the best way to validate their feelings while also advocating for your perspective? And bonus points if you can share, make, connect that to a, a, something in Star Wars. <laughs> well, it's a direct quote, and it's very, yeah. very cute. We appreciate that quote. Um, <laughs> Noam, do you want to do you want to start? Uh, I'll happily start, and just I think the best we can do is throw out. I'll throw out an aspect. You throw out an aspect, and let's see. Um, this comes up in a lot of situations generally when we when we ask about the notion of um, about the notion of empathy. Uh, you know how if I if I if I if I understand the other, if I if I try to seek to understand their point of view, you know that's a little scary. And one of the reasons it's scary is because then I won't be able to advocate for my own position as uh, you know as as significantly or as aggressively or as whatever it is as I would if I if I didn't know their point of view, if I didn't know what was what was motivating them. And I think um I think that in in general it's very it's very helpful, not easy, very helpful to separate between the notion of recognizing that they have a, a very different outlook on things. They like sand, they hate sand, I like sand, let's say, or you know, they think this is worth X and I think it's worth Y they feel hurt, okay? They feel I did something to them and I feel I don't did, I didn't do anything to them. There's a big difference between recognizing that that's how they feel and acknowledging that that's how they feel and um, thinking, assuming or enacting that as a result of that, I owe them anything. In other words, that it is my role to give them something as a result of them having this other viewpoint and that giving them something might be giving them my conceding that they're right I, I, that actually sand sucks right or my giving them saying oh you're right so i'll ask for i'll ask for, for a lower price because because you're right now if you can separate those two things then you'll be able to to handle these conflicts but you'll understand the other better you just won't feel that instant pull to pay a price for it that'll also encourage you to ask more questions about them because it's not as it's not as scary anymore. Jen, what are you? Yeah, I, I totally agree, and uh, mm -hmm. I think that the questions frame very well because um, it recognizes that there's when you're listening to somebody and they disagree with you, uh, that you know, validating feelings and um, advocating for your perspective are different activities, and so uh, 
we always say that, you know, you, that it's important to listen, to understand, um, and that you're not just listening so that you can convince that, you know, so you're trying to bide your time until it's time for you to say what it is that you want, that you actually do want to know where it is they're coming from and that your listening doesn't signify that you agree with them. Right. So if the, to the extent that the question is about, you know, how do we sort of coexist in these when we have differences, I think that that's, that those are just pretty good rules of thumb. To the extent the question is about, um, they don't like something I like, but it's important to me that they change, right? So like, it's important to me that they like what I like. So, you know, you could imagine like a married couple um, talking about like what to name the child or what, whatever it is, some, some something that they, that, they, uh, that, they, that they disagree about and you want to change their mind. It's not like good enough for you just for them to have their view and you to have your view and you both understand each other's views. Um, so the reason I'm saying this is because the word advocating is in this question. And so I just want to uh, make sure that, um, um, we address that as well. I mean, that's something that's, that's actually, you know, could be a little trickier and can require, I think, um, both the recognition that you can't necessarily change their perspective. You can't seek to understand it and understand what sort of underlies it. So to the extent that you can figure out why they feel the way they do, you often have a path forward to having kind of a deeper conversation around what might work for the both of us. It may not be that your perspective on that sand is great, you know, ends up winning the day, but it could be that you arrive in a place that you don't, you can't completely predict from the beginning just by engaging in this learning conversation. Um, and, you know, just to, to put a, not to, you know, to just put a reminder on it, uh, the fact that you've listened to somebody else and try to learn their perspective, you know, you also um, should feel like you can assert your own perspective and be listened to as well. So this is, it's a, it's a two-way street empathy and listening. Thank you both. We have another question. Uh, what lessons can we take from Star Wars to help inform national and global negotiations to address the climate crisis? Any thoughts on that? Okay, I do have a couple of thoughts. I um, uh, this actually kind of reminds me a little bit of what some of the things I was going to say about the oppressive evil empire, uh, because in our world, you know, in, in in superhero movies, you know, you have superheroes, and then you have a very obvious villain uh, who is a uh, who you know who looks like the emperor, who has lightning coming out of his fingers, who cackles maniacally, and this sort of thing. And we have different kinds of challenges that we face. You know, we have different villains that we face, climate change, poverty, uh, you know, the various, the various um, uh, problems that the world, you know, is confronting and has been, uh, needs to work through. And so um, I think that Star Wars gives us some good uh, advice for how to move forward in those spaces and maybe some bad advice. And so I'll just say a couple of things and then, and then see what Noam has to say. But in terms of good advice, I think that Star Wars really does emphasize the importance of identifying your strengths, leaning into them, training and, you know, preparing yourself so that you can be effective in the moment. So there is, there's sort of a individual prep kind of focus, you know, Luke training to be a Jedi. Um, it also really emphasizes the importance of relationships. You know, one of the things I think we need to do with respect to the climate crisis, et cetera, is, is uh, really emphasize the human dimension of these, of, of these, of these crises and the, and the cost to humans that, that these things have, you know, we, we need, we go, we move into abstractness so easily in our kind of uh, political conversations. And it's important to keep, I think, a focus on people when these, when we're discussing and Star Wars is very much about relationships and, you know, uh, and, and, and the importance of, of relationships. I will say that a way that Star Wars doesn't really help and something for us to all contemplate, um, there is kind of a message in Star Wars that a small band of rebels is the only way to effectuate change. You can't work through the government. It's gridlocked, it's corrupt, it's ineffective, you know, and, um, um, and this is bad because one of our most powerful ways of resisting, you know, bad things in our world is by voting and by having, you know, effective government. And so I think that, um, I think that, you know, it could, it could be better in that respect, but anyway, sorry, Noam, go ahead. 
<laughs> I think your 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 answer is much more pertinent, or at least much more on the on the conflict resolution um, and negotiation level of things. Because my answer is more uh, onto the conflict resolution slash political science uh, uh, realm of things. I, if there's anything that that big picture that I think from Star Wars is teaching us is that um, is, is that without plan effective planetary governance. Um, we are unprepared to face large scale crises. And the notion of, you know, our notion of functioning within 170 to 190 or to 205, depending on your number, nation states um, is remarkably antiquated. And it's also counterproductive. It serves all sorts of purposes for identity and for culture. It, it, it's, it's killing us as a planet. Uh, and I hope that at some point, uh, I mean, and since this is all we know to do, uh, you know, we don't really, many of us don't really consider, hey, could there actually be a planetary government? And I know we have the UN, but I'm actually talking about something that is a far more effective, has far more power. And, 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 and of course, as Jen said, that we actually get to vote for, um, but still manages to look at the big picture and offer big picture solutions. If you look at examples uh, in Star Wars, you know, we see representatives of systems <clears throat> and representatives of planets. Um, and that's the level at which most planets are uh, represented and governed in Star Wars. And in those who are not represented and governed at the planetary level, uh, we often see them as, as running, into, running into problems or being less effective or being more prone to disruption like the Gungan and the Naboo. Um, or there are a bunch of examples from, from the Clone War series. Um, and, and then again, Alderaan, until it was finally disrupted, uh, got along pretty well. I know that's, that's a terrible example to, to and counterproductive uh, uh, example to end well, but, but in terms of building a peaceful society um, and dealing with internal uh, conflicts, at least, there are other models than what we have now. There, I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Well, we are right at, at the one o'clock uh, um, buzzer. And so perfect uh, way to end. Thank you so much, Jen and Noam, for sharing your work with us and leading us in a really fascinating discussion today. And thank you to all of our uh, uh, attendees for tuning in. We hope you'll join us for the final webinar in our summer series on August 10th, when Professor Howie Arnett will explore the outcomes of Indian law cases in the current Supreme, Supreme Court term and what they mean for Indian law and policy moving forward. We hope to see you all there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Barbie. And thanks to everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you, Noam. Take care. Thank you, everybody.